morning folks and welcome to Active Building Centre and SGS College uh, debate on uh, workforce for the future or if you like skills for net zero. I'm Pat McLeod, Assistant Principal at SGS College. Uh, panel members, we have Siobhan Bailey, I think most of you will know, our MP for Stroud. Mark Southgate, Chief Executive of Moby, Ministry of Building, Innovation and Education. <laughs> Excellent. We have Louise, the head teacher of Berkeley Green UTC here on site at Berkeley, and Professor Peter Scully of uh, University College London, uh, involved with research and education in the built environment. Okay. I think what we will do is, as we go into the debate, the panellists can elaborate on their own particular areas of interest and expertise around skills and low carbon, and we'll go straight into the debate, the, the debate about, um, about um, skills for low carbon then. Uh, I think the obvious place to start is probably the strategy for Net Zero, published earlier this week. Um, it seems to me, if we're going to get to Net Zero, we've got to unravel technological challenges lots on that. We've got to create the economic circumstances to take up the low carbon choices and we need the skilled workforce uh, to, to, to enable all of that to happen. Is there sufficient detail in the strategy on the skills we need for net zero? Should we start with Siobhan? Yeah, no, thank you. Forgive me with all my pieces of paper, but I uh, read policy at the weekend and this was announced this week. <laughs> so I, I've been sort of passing, but I, um, I just want to make sure I had it to my fingertips. I mean, ultimately, um, I have been saying for quite some time we've got a green skills emergency. So we, we are now starting to deliver some really meaningful changes with our, um, our strategy and uh, to meet our targets for 2050. But, uh, we don't have the people, and we are not up to date with the skills, and um, uh, and we've got to be realistic about that. So there's there's two parts. I wrote an essay about there's two parts, um, uh, and the first part is helping people transition with skills uh, who are already in the industries and particularly in the fossil fuel industries because we know we're making changes as a North Sea transition strategy that has been put in place and the second part is about education. I mean just a, a couple of stats and by way of an example at the moment we only have 5% of mechanics that can fix electric cars. Uh, we know that we are phasing out uh, petrol and diesel cars. Uh, we know that many more people are buying electric cars, but that maintenance of that will be a massive problem. Not that long ago, there was only about 3,500 people that were able to um, help with the energy efficient measures um, for our homes. Uh, we need 50,000 of those skilled <coughs> people, and I'm a massive fan of SGS, and I've spoken to Dave about this, and that, that need to kind of skill up our youngsters. Um, and, and infuse them because I mean I get letters all the time from school kids that telling me what to do and telling me to go and talk to Boris about what to do and, and, and saying how interested they are about the environment and so my message always back to them is you know think about doing science think about doing your maths think about doing physics and make sure that you are going to be the solutions of the future. So rather than being doom and gloom, I'm not a doom and gloom uh, environmentalist. I'm very much that there are solutions and, uh, uh, and options to, to make changes. So that kind of reskilling and education is absolutely key. The net zero strategy is not sitting uh, alone in its a silo. We are actually, we have a, uh, a skills bill going through the house. I'm a further education ambassador for the Department for Education, mainly because I pecked the head of the Secretary of State for so long, they gave me a role to shut me up, because I have been going on and on and on about further education, um, partly because I didn't go to university myself, I went into uh, to work and work my way up, but also because I could see when I went to places like SGS, there is absolutely fantastic youngsters in there that want to start their own businesses and want to get on, uh, and there should be many more routes into good, solid jobs that we all know are there uh, and particularly for, um, uh, for for green skills so um, so that kind of that change like the last time uh, the country had a, uh, a skills 
uh, strategy and a new skills approach. Uh, we, ha we were using 40% coal, and you know where we are with coal at the moment, so it's been massively uh, long overdue to make these changes and to make sure that our schools uh, and our colleges and our universities are kind of a little bit more joined up, but with a lot more love, in my view, with our colleges and our FE and our apprentice sector than we've had, um, we've had before. And alongside that, again, alongside the net zero strategy, we're all printed out, we can go into more detail in a moment, but the, alongside the net zero strategy, we're doing Kickstarter programs, for example. You know, the Ecotricity took on 21 Kickstarters um, who went through an SGS program before they even got into a, to Kickstarter. So they were able to go into the world of work. These people, these are young people on long time welfare. Do shut me up, by the way, because I could talk about this all day. And um, and you know, and we've got apprentices. We've got a Kickstarter down at Green Fuels here. Green Fuels, an amazing company that are now looking to try and turn sewage into aviation fuel. So we've got young people that are going into these subjects and really wanting. So I don't want anybody to look at any government policy and think it's the only one thing that is happening because in the whole suite of, of actions and the whole suite of things across all government departments it's a real focus mm. uh, and for myself I mean I'm just a mere backbencher but you know the noise coming from the backbenches to make this work is is really strong so sorry thank you Sean no, it's good. Hand over. So, thank you Sean um, probably I should just say briefly who maybe are because you don't know so maybe Ministry of Building Innovation and Education um, and we are a charity set up by George Clark the um, architect and TV presenter He's got uh, two real passions in his way. He's got three, one Sunderland FC, but we'll get that one. Uh, the other two are how do we get young people into into uh, the built environment and how do we improve the homes that we build because they're really not good enough in, in a whole bunch of ways. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, that further education thing is really, really important. Uh, that's the route he took. Um, we need to open up education and opportunities to a whole bunch of people. And the thing about the built environment is really weird. It's everywhere. 9% of the UK population work in the built environment, yet for most people it's a bit invisible. As a career option, it's very invisible at schools. If there is any careers advice, it's often for, unfortunately, less, less academically able males, normally because they're much more with their hands, um, and they're sent, go work on a construction site, and that's the view of the built environment. Yet it's this massive industry having a massive impact on climate change. So your, your question was around the strategy, and of course the strategy doesn't have the detail. The detail is underneath, and it's how we join those things up. But the green agenda, and young people's concern about the green agenda and they want to do something different, well, the built environment is 40% of UK emissions, either in the building or the running of it. Massive opportunity to have a real, real difference. So what we need to try and do is, is, is open up those opportunities, show them that sector. That sector is desperate, like many others, for skills. It has had a ticking time bomb. There's another <laughs> session going on, will the industry might not well die? That was a report by Mark Farmer, one of our trustees, six years ago now, about the ticking time bomb of the construction industry uh, it's something like 20% of the people in construction now are over 50 and about 15% of them are over 60, so they are going to be retiring soon. And the intake is about 5%. So there's a real problem and it's not an attractive industry, but it could be if we set it a real way. So I, I think the, the combination of that focus on FE skill just think is really good and hasn't been seen for a while from, from government, from uh, of any persuasion, is really good, plus that focus on you know, the green agenda and the fact that we're holding COP26 in the, in the UK gives a real opportunity to open up the, the eyes to kids who want to make a difference. They really want to make a difference. They're a passionate generation. And I don't think they want to do any old job. They want to do a job which makes a difference. So, so that's yeah. a massive opportunity. We just want to show them what's available now. There. So Louise, your students have a uh, sight of green skills and a, a, a green career, a career in the low carbon sector. Yes, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about the UTC because obviously we're in a very different position from someone like Siobhan who's looking top down nationally and locally at what the, the Green Skills agenda looks like. I'm the head teacher of a local school, um, but we're a very different kind of school to those that you see um, across the county um, and beyond. So the question that was posed to the panel was what will the workforce of the future look like and in many meaningful ways the workforce of the future is going to look like the workforce right now unless we do something a little bit differently it's going to be GCSEs and A levels and a broad range of subjects with uh, insufficient resources in school environments to give young people particularly the technical skills that they're going to need to go out there and make a real difference and that's where schools like ours really come into their own so we're a UTC that's a university Technical College, which means we're sponsored by a university, the University of Gloucestershire. So we work with them on introducing young people to higher education and how they need to equip themselves ready for that stage 
of their career if that's the direction they want to go in. And we're a technical college, so the, the technical stuff is all about local workforce, um, local needs, local employability. And our young people take one of two routes. They either specialise in engineering or they specialise in digital and cyber security. And that's across the board. So we still offer a reasonably broad curriculum in government terms, but actually the young people that join us between the ages of 14 and 19, they are very clear about their career direction at that point. They know what they want to do. They don't want to go do a big range of GCSEs. They want to really specialise. And one of the things that's happened um, through the UTC movement, so I think there are 47 of us nationally, is we've had additional investment from the government, which means our resources are outstanding. So um, you're very welcome to wander over next door, and I'm very happy to show any of you around during the day. But if you come into our school, we have an enormous engineering barn that is full of industry standard equipment. Our young people know what it's like to walk into a work environment, use that equipment, and they think about how to apply that on a day-to-day -day basis. And the same is true on the digital front. All of our curriculum was established in consultation with local employers. So an employer board help us set up the UTC. They help us determine the broader curriculum. That's the examined curriculum. What subjects do we offer? What qual qualifications do young people need? But also what we call our values in practice curriculum. So that's things like projects. Employers, so for example, you know, Moby's been in and said, we're going to set you a challenge about green buildings for the future. What would you do? What would they look like if you were in charge of designing <coughs> these buildings? Our young people then develop teamwork skills, our presentation skills, creativity, which we also think is incredibly important, and they present back to the employer. Um, so they get that real sense of interaction with the real world that goes beyond the classroom. And we think all those things are incredibly important. So we think we're a bit of a model for what uh, the schools of the future need to look like if we're going to produce the workforce of the future. Excellent. Um, so my name is Peter Scully. I've come up to today from London, so University College London. Um, so my, my area of research is in design for manufacture, looking how design can really, um, through understanding the affordances of materials, people, processes, actually take on quite a lot of responsibility um, for, the, for the outcomes of you know, the, the objects in the built environment. I'm also a programme um, director for a master's course in design for manufacture and also the leader of, of a facility called the Bartlett Manufacturing Design Exchange. So this is all about Bartlett manufacturing and design. Um, uh, but hearing about the conversation around skills today, and, and I'm really quite interested to hear about this term green skills, because I, I, would, I would actually like to know what they are, because I don't mm. really. Um, and the bit that I would, I think is probably most important to address is, you know, our built environment for the last, you know, it hasn't really evolved, if I'm truly honest, for the last hundred years. Um, and in the last <coughs> 40 years, we've been obsessed with this idea of productivity in terms of, and what we've turned into is the kind of financialization of an industry that is the fundamental product of that is money. And it is not product, it's not the built environment. So we are seeing, um, we're seeing the built environment being used as a vehicle for finance. And that's a bit of a problem. The last few years, we've seen a focus on looking at what the built environment needs to do in terms of you know, being a higher performance entity, being green. Okay. But we really failed in terms of productivity in the UK. And what we're asking, what we're asking as a lot of the companies in the UK and a lot of strategy is turning around at this point and saying, we need more skills to be able to deliver the built environment that we want. And I think that question's kind of the wrong way around. We need the built environment we design to deliver the skills and the markets to support those skills. So we're, we're thinking that the skills are a pathway to get the built environment that we want. But we're not built designing a built environment that supports those skills markets. We design risk out of the built environment. Our buildings rely on back-to-back -back contracts that don't depend on NVQs and BTECs and 15 years of experience in the trade. They don't, do, because if we do that, we attract risk into our building contracts. So what would, be what would be a much, much more holistic approach in order to be able to start really understanding the status is understanding what the built environment can do from us 
do for us in terms of us procuring it. The byproduct of the built environment will be the skills communities that we support, that we can see mm -hmm. that's, that's, going <coughs> on, that's going on here. And I think young people really do understand this to be the case. The amount of talent that is opting out at the ages from 11 onwards is, is quite remarkable. In, I've got a team of about 30 people working in manufacturing and trades and design and robotics and engineering. And four, about maybe four or five of those people, GCSE is absolutely terrible, okay? But they have come into our manufacturing environment and found a place for them. They are now teaching skills and master's courses in UCL, okay? So we are kind of, we're not a model for the future, we're, we're kind of just odd, I think. <laughs> but seeing that kind of talent harnessed, that talent is in the UK, okay? But we really do, I think, need a, a skills agenda that is thought about differently, very differently, not as an obstacle. We need these, we need these skills until we, we do this. We need to decide what the this is and make sure the output of this is a skills community as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so mentioned from uh, Siobhan about career changes and converts from the from the fossil fuel sector. Mentioned from Mark about the the demographic time bomb, if you like, in construction, and we're seeing it in other um, in other sectors, aren't we? Mo most notably, um, HGV and logistics. Um, so, so where are we going to get the green workforce from? Who are these people? Um, I, are you clear on the roles for the graduates, Peter, from HE institutions? Sh should, we, should we start this end? <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, the one, one of the things that, um, that we're really looking at at the moment is that um, the graduates that f for the master's courses that we're involved in, um, the master's, we are, there was a kind of two-tone education system going on there. We are, we are training them to be the leaders of the technologies, you know, sort of next-gen technologies in and around certainly green outcomes for the built environment. Um, but we also need to them to be meaningful going into the workforce today. The employment sector at the moment, especially in the large architectural firms, in the engineering firms, they still have uh, a kind of operational legacy that was born a very long time ago. And so starting putting next generation students into that, they're unemployable. Mm. You know, if all they can use is Grasshopper, Computation and Python, okay, um, there's going to be people wanting, well, I just, I need to have the calcs on this building done and I need it done. Mm. Okay, I don't care how you do it. So we need to train, w you know, we need to educate students that are useful, first of all, immediately today, uh, but also to have <laughs> the thinking and the education to be able to evolve those, those companies going forward. And it is, and one thing I would say, and this is probably not in my own best um, interest of, of the business that I'm in, is that we, we really do, do need to uh, rethink higher education, so the university sector being the ultimate outcome of secondary schools, because it's not. Okay, that's, that's a myth, okay? We, there is a culture, I think there is a quite a strong culture that in a, a successful outcome of schools is going to university. And that, that, needs, that needs dismantling that idea, I think. Mm. Okay, or certainly repurposing. Mm. Thank you. Louise, do you want to pick yeah, up Just that? very Thank briefly, um, it's going to sound like another ad for the UTC, so apologies for that. Um, but I think something like a UTC does exactly that. It aims to dismantle that approach because yeah. we don't value one type of education above another. It's very much technical, vocational, alongside traditional academic. Our students mix and match qualifications. They, uh, you know, a couple. They might take a couple of A levels. They might take a couple of practical subjects alongside. And for them, the idea that university is the outcome is actually very much on the back burner. That's not that we're not aspirational for the students. They are aspirational for themselves. But just to give you an example, um, we've got two students this year. They're both applying for Oxbridge. They both want to do maths plus something. Um, at Oxbridge, but actually that's their second choice. So they're doing Oxbridge as their backup because what they really want is a degree level apprenticeship with the kind of organisation they want to work for. They're very well, clear about that. Similarly for us, the step off point at 16, we do not regard as a failure. So if our students at 16 say, I'm at that point where I'm ready for an apprenticeship at a local employer that I know does the kind of things I want to do, we regard that as a successful outcome. 
So I think alongside the changes that need to happen in terms of structures and schooling and so on, performance measures for schools nationally need to shift to recognise that. We do a good job and the government says to us, actually, you're kind of exempt from the performance table side of things. I think it would be helpful if that was looked at more broadly so that other schools could take a similar approach so that the right students are doing the things that are right for them. So you're very encouraging to hear what's been said on the left and I, and I think we're actually probably at a period of quite significant change where we do need to shake things up quite radically. So Peter's point about what are the skills we tra we're training for. We are still training for traditional construction, let's call it that, because we're short of those and we've got 300,000 houses to build by the middle of the, this, this, de this decade uh, and we're way short of that. But we also want to change the way we build those things because we are still building like we did 150 years ago and so many other sectors have changed dramatically. So part of what maybe is about is bringing manufacturing thinking in and yes, that's modern methods of construction where you put them, you know, you, you will assemble a large part of the home in a factory, also build it in a factory and assemble it out on site. But it's also about bringing manufacturing and questioning thinking to everything we do, because by goodness, doesn't housing, housing at, that we build now need that question why about so many parts of the practice? Because it's not a great product, really. It's not a great product for the consumer. It doesn't perform brilliantly. You know, the snagging list you get on a new house are horrendous and you wouldn't accept them from a mobile phone or something else. So there's, there's some deep problems there. So I think it is about that sort of th those new things. And then the other one, the other green skill we are going to be crying out for is retrofit. 27 million homes to be retrofitted. And the lesson of how we've done it in the past, we've applied money to do retrofitting of buildings, <coughs> but we haven't trained people properly. So we've had, let's call them, not well-trained or cowboy operators who are making a fast buck but haven't done the job properly and therefore the whole thing gets devalued. So there's a programme going on across the water and over the, over the hill and over the, yeah. over the woods to the other side in Wales called Optimised Retrofit where the Welsh Government's put some money in to look at how do you assess what homes need and not on a one-size-fits-all but looking at over 2,000 homes, going individually assessing them, giving them their own what they call pathways to zero and thinking about what the skills are required to do that. So I think it's a really detailed piece of that engineering about this is what we need, this is the skills we need and this is how we train them. So my biggest worry I think is that we don't train them the right way, we have non-skilled people or sk people with the wrong skills doing the jobs and we'll devalue <coughs> the whole thing about you know, um, need to decarbonise and we'll waste a lot of money. So I think there's a real urgent need and it's going to need to bang in some heads together. It's not going to be simple stuff. So I think if, if, if the message were to go back to government, it's great having the strategy, but this is going to require some serious rethinking if we're going to get it right. But the price is massive. The price is really massive. Um, join the list. Everyone <laughs> writes to me with a massive long list of what the price is. Um, no, I think Professor Scully's challenge is the right one. So you, you, uh, how do we um, deal with what we are planning for, what, what we need to see with the built environment, um, but also taking what Mark's just said, also think about the challenges of now. Uh, and that's why I think that the two-pronged of the reskilling and the education, which is where Louise comes in, you know, how do we get youngsters thinking early on um, what type of education will lead to potential jobs that we might not even know exist yet because things are changing um, so so much um, and and we're hoping for technology we're, we've put a really successful so far touch wood uh, b uh, bid in for the fusion uh, first the world's first fusion power plant to be here locally um, for Barclay and Albury and that will create a thousand apprentices you know that, that this is work that hasn't been done before so we know that we got to we've got to have um, you know that future skill and future planning I mean I I think it's interesting when you, your first challenge was uh, what is green skills. I mean, I, I coined that phrase to make a bit of a fuss in Parliament, to cause some trouble. Um, but you know, and, and everything's an emergency at the moment. But I think this genuinely is. Uh, but but once you kind of row back from that, if you're thinking about the education, actually, what are the nuts and bolts of getting young people ready for these future? And that is the science. That is the maths. That is the physics. Um, you know, that that is. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have English grads and English majors, but it does mean that we have to be thinking and. and I think perhaps schools need a bit of help with that. There's a lot of teachers that will say to me that they are not confident about teaching uh, teaching in those subjects. A lot of them have not done it before, and they're not talking to primary school children about it. And then with the retrofits, um, I do think government, what they are doing with, um, and Professor Scully may have a, another view, and I'll be interested to know, but with, with the 
focus on phasing out the planning to phase out does force change in markets so we've got mm -hmm. the phasing out of petrol and diesel cars we will be you know there's a real focus on diesel um, on electric <coughs> vehicles which will then bring the market in for the maintenance and the electricians and things like that we've just had the announcement on the gas boilers you know that's an ability to plan it's not perfect for everybody people want us to go faster but it does give an ability to plan and do these skills and think about that built environment of the future but non, none of this is easy uh, and, I, and there, I'd get a lot more screaming at me if I was asking businesses to change overnight so I do think we need these lead-in times and I do think we all <coughs> need to be focused on how um, and the what works but um, but I think we're, we are getting there I th I'm much more confident now um, th than I was even a year ago or two years ago subject to the pandemic throwing everything out but Mark, could I just ask you for a moment to elaborate a little bit on what we mean by retrofit? Are we, are we talking yeah. insulation? Are we talking triple glazing or, or the whole so, so retrofit is really de decarbonising the, the, uh, the, the buildings that we're in. Um, and it will be a whole bunch of different things. And, and that's why I like what there's been, what's been tried in Wales in terms of this going in and doing this assessment of these individual properties, which will probably give you a typology of, you know, a mid-Victorian terrace will end up being, you know, the, the pathway to zero is going to be these things. But it will be a whole bunch of different technologies, uh, but, but, it, but it's going to require a different approach and a different set of thinking. So I'm really passionate about now. We know things are changing. So that, that we do know. So what we should not be doing is teaching the same old things. Yes, anybody going through construction at the moment should be taught in the traditional trades because they need those, but they also need to know about modern mm -hmm. manufacturing techniques, they need to know about retrofitting and, and what that means, because they, within their working <laughs> lifetime, and probably hopefully quite soon within their working lifetime, they need to pick those things up. So I was in Bedford yesterday, and Bedford have just opened up their Connolly Centre for Advanced um, Construction, and that is about a traditional construction college with let money, interestingly, investing in a modern method element as well. So they will be taking their, their youngsters through that traditional construction, which we need and is desperately needed, but also making damn sure that they are trained in things that they will be using in the future. So, so I think retrofit is, it's, it's going to be a whole bunch of different technologies, and it may be right, some of them we don't even know yet, but, it's, but I know it's not simple. It's going to require, so it requires assessors to go in and do that assessment. It's going to require people who are doing gas, gas borders to, to, to start working with new technology and thinking about in five or 10 years' time, what will, what will I be doing? Because you won't be fitting gas boilers. Um, so what does that new technology look like? It will be uh, insulation. It's going to be a whole bunch of different technologies, um, some of which, which the ABC are inventing you know, just behind us right now. You know, some of those are, are, are really groundbreaking and will be you know, new technologies that we're all learning. Uh, but I think the exciting thing is kid, that, yeah, the, 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 the reason for hope for me is kids get really passionate about the built environment when we engage them mm -hmm. at primary school level. We, the classes we engaged here, there were two or three who, as, as we've heard, are heading towards you know, probably engineering or cyber. Uh, actually, two or three of them thought, well, I never thought about applying digital, my digital knowledge in the built <coughs> environment. We're crying out for it because we're still doing handwritten drawings. We ought mm. to be doing digital drawings and being doing stuff in 3D. So yeah, so that's so retrofit. It's going to be complex. We probably don't know what it is yet. We need to invest in understanding it, but we really need to train people. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's actually an attempt to define the green skills in the net zero strategy. So you've obviously made your marks, Siobhan. Uh, <laughs> they've uh, they've uh, a very broad definition of the, of the skills directly or indirectly uh, contributing to our path to net zero. So th th there's a definition there. Um, let, let's drill down to a level of detail then and think about um, the, the work such as the active building centre are doing and, and Mark and Peter's involvement directly in the built environment and skills there. So 600,000 heat pumps needed to be installed per year by the time we get to 2028. A lot of training for a lot of installers and we can apply the same um, to all the aspects of retrofit, <coughs> um, the boilers, the insulation. Um, dread to think of the consequences of poor training and poor installs. Um, so where does this training responsibility sit? Who are we going to rely on? Is it employers, manufacturers, installers, colleges, training providers? Um, Peter, do you want to start on that one? Good God. <laughs> 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 well, um, I was just thinking as, um, as we were speaking there is, it, is that you know, we shouldn't be at this point. You know, we really shouldn't. We, we've kind of designed a problem. You know, we, we kind of set these goals to deliver 600, how many thousands of heat pumps? 600,000. Yeah. 600,000 heat pumps. And we, we know we haven't got the pathway to deliver it. So that is, that's a designed problem. So we have made that problem. That doesn't, hasn't, that hasn't come out of the blue. So, so that's not going to be my answer. Um, although I wish it was. Um, 
But where, where does that train? I mean, the training for that really has got to come out of the markets, I think. Yeah. If there is a need for the, if there is a need for those for that work to be done, you would think that that need would sponsor the need for the training to happen. Okay, but at what cost? Where does that who's that responsibility lie with? Is that government responsibility? Is it a you know a local council responsibility? Is this something? Ca is there some kind of government part? private relationship where we start looking at coalition um, of agendas there so that if a council is, is supporting this at a local a local initiative can it be part privatized I, I really don't know um, but it, it does it does need to happen and the problem is is that with the best will in the world anyone or any firm or any entity or any individual who is wanting <coughs> to do the best the best architecture, the best buildings that they can do, it is treated as a taste the difference often, uh, option. It is charged at a premium. Mm. And that's a problem. But if it's charged at a premium, you, th you would think the market would respond and say, hang on a sec, this green stuff you can really make money out of. Mm. But it doesn't. And that's a strange thing. Maybe it doesn't respond. Yeah, no, I, I, think, it's a, I think what we've had is, um, Sorry, a, a real stop-start situation <coughs> as well. So we had a real push with solar, feed-in tariffs, everybody was kind of thinking about what to do that. We had a, lots and lots of people trained um, to be insulated. Um, Dave is more expert in this than I am. Uh, and then the, the kind of the tariffs were turned off and the market slowed down to the point of stopping in some areas. And then you've got a lot of very trained people that have to work, that went on often trained to do other things. And because we've got a massive boom in our construction, you know, people are being paid pretty well, you know, they went off and done it. So we've now lost all of those skills rather than saying, okay, either retain them and keep a consistent line on that, that renewable line or um, get them training into other areas. And, and we had the same with the green homes grant you know that was a big boom and around here we've got so many amazing experts and suppliers um, really interested and the, the, the demand for the green homes grant was really high and the vouchers were really high and then the administration was really poor and government took a very difficult decision I think it was the right decision it was painful but the right decision to stop it uh, and, and refocus on elsewhere so you've got a whole industry that's waiting for the next kind of dictat or guidance from government. Um, so I do think the, the announcements this week are really welcome. But I mean, for me, I'm biased, but I would fund Dave and the SGS uh, construction team and please, with people like Nicola, um, who was on the stage, the open stage earlier, who's doing some amazing work. And that is, co that's a, uh, you know, a part private uh, enterprise, Moby, you know, I would, I would fund and make the general public aware and schools and, col and other colleges aware of what we've got in Gloucestershire. So our youngsters and people are thinking, you know, I'd quite like to get into this green <laughs> gig. It looks like it's going to be mm. a sustainable, long-term, uh, you know, money-making enterprise, and actually they go to those skilled people. So it's, I don't think it should always be government, but I think for, to get the market moving, um, you know, things like to bring down the cost of heat pumps, if we could make sure that our local authorities are uh, in a good place to get their stock, their housing stock, uh, in, in an energy-efficient way, uh, and the new homes, I think we're going to have to require developers and uh, developers <coughs> and mandate developers to put this stuff into the new the properties. If you do that, the market will start to move. You start to bring the costs down. People start to be aware of those jobs. But yeah, I think fund our colleges for it would be my starting point. Well, that stimulated a lot of thoughts in, in mind. And uh, that continuity question is crucial because we did have mm. the zero carbon home standard and it was taken away. And that's mm. not the first time. I think we need all party consensus around some of these things around actually this is a direction of travel which we don't want to change and mess around with you. Know, we may tinker, but we're not going to suddenly turn it off because that's a real issue. But I, I see quite a lot of things happening. So you talked about Axel over there in Cinderford, and um, that is partly let funded, great, but it's also partly private funded by Bell. And why did they do it? They're an £80 million business who thought the biggest risk that they face is they're not going to have the, the, the construction employees to do the, their business into the future. So they've invested £1.9 million of their own money into creating a, a training centre to train the future construction workforce. Um, I think in the modular section or, section or in the you know, modern methods of manufacturing, we're seeing quite a few of those firms not finding the people they want, so they're creating their own academies. So one of the things I'm testing, I, I'm part of the Offsite Alliance, and we've created a skills group to try and test around 
is that, you know, are you doing that because you want to industry because nobody else is providing it? And the answer is, well, actually, nobody else is providing it. OK, well, how could we create a cohort of people who will provide it? Which means we've now found a number of the colleges who are willing to do this training. But what they need, and I think it was hinted at before, is the people who have the skills. And the current guys who are there don't have the skills. There's no reason why they should. They've come through the traditional trades. This is really new technology. It's moving so fast that I have to run really fast to keep up, and I don't. So actually, the best people to come in and teach that stuff is industry, what we've heard from, the, from UTC. So it's about how do you get the industry interest to coalesce with the colleges who are keen on delivering it and bringing in industry trainers as well as those college pe people to do it. So I think it's a, it's a hybrid solution. It's beginning to emerge elsewhere. I think probably the one thing that government needs to do is mine that gap, because when you do create that sort of end point, there tends to be a tendency for the colleges if they can't afford to train people until they've got the bums on seats, because that brings in the income. And that won't happen until it absolutely gets to that end point. But actually, what you know is that demand will start increasing at one point. If you haven't got the people to do it, that's a problem. So I think it's that small gap of how do we encourage some of the colleges and help them to bring people in and start training them because we know we need them. It's just the economics don't quite work for the colleges right now. So that's the one thing I would focus on. But I don't think that's a big gap. That's probably a three to five year gap. Uh, it just needs a bit of planning. <laughs> we done on that one? <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so who who owns the training then? G given I, I don't think we've covered yet, have we that that risk of of, of poor installs? Do, do we need an accreditation system as we've got for gas engineers at the moment? Um, do we rely on manufacturers and employers, or do we actually say no? We need the colleges to put the building blocks in, to put the basics, the um, the foundations for transferable skills. Which I'll start has got the microphone, so we definitely need the colleges. We need to agree what the standards are, you know, agree that Peter's point about what is it we're trying to train, but then we do need the regulation, and actually, we need the regulation in force. So, I think one of the unfortunate things about the Grenfell tragedy is there was a regulatory regime in place, but it did not work effectively. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, there's a bit around how do we make sure that that works. So, it's not putting regulation in is not enough, it feels like it's enough, but you've got to make sure that's instilled, and that should be really instilled through culture and customer demand. So, so you'd, you'd hope that customers <laughs> would not take, the, in that choice, they didn't have the choice, but they wouldn't accept the level that is being provided and they'll demand something and then that the industry feels it has to because it's part of its reputation. Um, that's maybe Nirvana, but that's where I'd, where I'd like to be. So that combination of regulation, understood standards at the college level and the industry and culture driving that to a degree as well, but that it's not good enough to be fly by night. That's not the way we do things now. We want to do things with quality because quality actually often is the best way of doing it economically. I think there were, um, just on kind of the Grenfell point, I'm sitting on the building um, fire safety bill, um, and uh, we are actually trying to build into the new legislation um, checks, measures, yeah. balances. So we've got things like accountable persons. You've got you know, committees, and you've got the ability for and an awful lot of um, uh, for, for tower blocks uh, resident involvement. So that that need for the management companies to liaise more closely. So so I think we'll see smarter legislation coming out of the awful tragedy um, with Grenfell and, and some of that, but it won't be perfect. It does require a culture change in lots of areas, um, and, and that has to come from all of us. You know, that has to come from policy makers, yeah, academic papers, colleges, uh, and industry. But I, I think there is some good work <coughs> being done at the moment, but sadly out of some horrific, uh, horrific tragedy. Okay. So, given that we're in a, <laughs> given that we're in a, a, a sector where technology and policy are moving apace, uh, does a, a demand-led skill system work for that? Is it going to be reactive enough? Will we generate capacity, enough courses in enough colleges to provide regional solutions fast enough to keep pace uh, with technological changes that are required? <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> so I like the phrase "demand-led skills strategy." So effectively, yeah, yeah. we're in a system where DFE funding yeah. is demand-led. Yeah, 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 It's responsive. Um, the FE skills white paper um, is asking us to be even more employer responsive. Yeah. I, I would. S I. Th I think it's for me. It's split into two areas. There's there's the kind of there is the really complex work of standardization, uh, skills, what we're trying to do with that, the work of the colleges, 
the kind of uh, sort of country or statewide vision uh, for manufacturing, construction, so on. And that whole ecosystem, that's hard work and it's complex. Okay. And I think they've got the kind of rough deal here, actually, because they've got to kind of sort out a mess, which I think has got an economic culture problem. And so I think you've got to address the kind of pathway out, the solution, but I have also think you've got to look at the economic problem. So if we look at how we fund the built environment, so I'm, I'm not, I mean, some of the examples that we mentioned today, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from London, my head's in a hole all the time, I don't know what's going on out there. Awful. Okay, if I just put my hand up to that. But when I hear what's going on out here, the innovation that's going on out here, I mean, that's, that is, you know, just fantastic, you know. But what I see so often uh, in the projects that I've been working on and the projects uh, that we've been researching is that the pressure from the financial model in and around the built environment does not allow for the sorts of strategic goals that we have for skills and for product quality and for the green outcomes. The financial model just doesn't. I mean, if look at how we fund major projects, either through investment or pension funds or whatever, okay, it's a culture of value extraction. So the built environment is a, an investment opportunity, okay, that if there is any money left in the system after it, the kind of measure of productivity hasn't worked hard enough. <coughs> so the way we fund the built environment, okay, it's not thrown to leave skills, because leaving skills in people means that you didn't send all the money back to the investor. I mean, that's it, really. So if we start tasking the built environment with green agendas, you know, social responsibility, sort of investing in people, that money's got to come from somewhere. And at the moment, if you, if you look at the construction industry, what, what's their surplus, their profit at the moment is what, sub 1% at the moment, should go higher with the boom coming up. But the real money has been, has been happened by you know, the financial products here. So we need to change the architecture of the finance behind it if we are to stand any chance of actually creating a demand-led skill strategy. And absolutely, I would think. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I think we're, si we're going to see that change, um, partly because of the uh, challenge for the country at the moment in this transition out of COVID with the recovery uh, post Brexit with our you know new 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 world in that respect and um, the lack of labour force so we've got companies that are going to have to look after their staff to retain them mm -hmm. and and it's annoying employers um, because I think you know unfortunately it's happening you know, take the haulage companies at the moment so you know we've got local haulage companies I won't name them but uh, right up the road from where I live um, and he's paying his driver 17% more um, to get get drivers uh, and and the, and then when you listen to the Department for Transport it's quite negative about the haulage companies it's saying that they haven't trained they haven't retained uh, and that's work but so I think that that kind of piece of work that gets um, gets companies being socially responsible and skilling up their own workforce will have to happen to keep keep that star and um, and I, but I think more widely I do think you know I'm thinking government and policy and you know, I do think there's only so much government can do even though we've had a massive interventionist period and people have got used to government trying to fix everything um, but you know, that approach of finding getting colleges to think about the next step. I mean, Louise is doing it very naturally. Where are our young people going to go? How do we make sure they're able to walk out of here, get a job, go to college, go to university, and making sure that that link is very, very clear? Because I think historically, um, and with a kind of push to try and get 50% of youngsters into university, making university the only thing, regardless of the outcome, regardless of what you are going to achieve with that degree, um, you, you and you know, people, people got stuck and it also forgot about the other 50%, but that employer-led uh, and workforce-led uh, education, I think, is a positive thing. I do. Yeah, I think I've back to something I said before. So, so you know, you've already got examples locally of employers who are mm -hmm. stepping into that space because that's their, one of the key business risks. And actually, we've known in construction that skills has been a 
it's been there as a big issue for a long while, but it's always been about four or five. My sense is it's two or one now. <laughs> and we're seeing what's happening in the agriculture sector, and we're seeing what's happening in the haulage sector, and that is a sign of things to come, exactly they're already here. So there's a bit around that, so there'll be a great deal of self-interest. Um, I started my career in local government, and the thing I learned from local government is we need to join up, because local government is notorious about reinventing the wheel over and over again in different places, because they don't talk to each other. So one of the things we've been trying to do is maybe... Chief Executive okay, local so government. Okay, so but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's getting better, but, what, but industry and colleges are the same. So actually what we're trying to do is get those industries who are interested in doing a different way of constructing homes together to talk about their skills and try and pull them, because the worst thing they can do is train some guys who can work in their factory in North Yorkshire and then they have to go somewhere else because for family reasons. Say they move to Kent and they can't work at Barclay in Kent because they've been trained in a different way. So my question to them was, well, you know, okay, if you don't want to do the training yourself, have you got a, school, um, a core skill set? And we agreed there was about a 70% core skill set. So they shouldn't be doing that. Train them on your systems, but let somebody else do that. And that's where we've identified the colleges who are now interested in doing a bit of modern me methods. We're connecting them because they get an investment from LEP. So what can you learn from the last person who took LEP investment? The crucial questions I asked were, what did you buy which you wish you bought twice as much of and what did you buy which you wish you'd never bought at all in terms of equipment because that's the best lesson you can get from them and we're doing that exchange so i think some of that's going to happen organically so there'll be a bit of industry demand i think um nicola referred to it you know the 50 percent of the homes built by the volume house builders who are doing very well on their financial model and don't currently really need to change mm. although actually even they are because e barclay invested and created its modular uh, um, factory down in north kent mainly because it felt it got a ticking time bomb in relation to where's the labour coming from, particularly in the south east and around London. Mm. So it felt we're not going to attract people to our industry unless we change the way we do things. Yeah. So that's why they built that factory. So I think it's really interesting that's one of their prime reasons was not about the product, it was about where have we got the labour force to build it and we'll have to do it in a different way. So I think there are some signs and anything we can do to encourage and share best practice has got to be good. Mm -hmm. Just a very quick one from me because honestly not particularly my area of expertise, but one thing that crops up, crops up continually in the school sector and the FE sector is just the funding and the difficulty in making change. So we might talk about the change, there might be huge amounts of creativity and innovation that are just stifled because making the books balance is becoming incredibly difficult. And I think in FE in particular, there's a bit of a ticking time on there that needs to be addressed at some point. So. You know, that is a political statement, and it's not my job to make political statements, but I think it's true across the sector, regardless of where you are. You're looking at me. It. Everyone wants <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. No, 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 I'm joking. That's right. OK, let, let's pick up on that point sh from Siobhan then on, uh, on, on, the, on the current labour crisis and on capacity, uh, on um, Mark's point <laughs> about um, organically um, generating um, capacity and, and, and about industry demand, is that going to suffice? At the moment we're looking at um, a, a green skills sector which is niche and um, presumably if, if we're going to meet the carbon budget time frame we're going to meet a point of mass adoption where all of a sudden as homeowners we're retrofitting our homes, we're fitting hydrogen boilers, we're fitting heat pumps and then we're going to get an industrial sector that is crying out for trained installers, trained retrofit engineers. Possibly even more complex as well, we'll move to a system where it's not one solution for a property, it's, it's maybe a combination of air source, ground source, solar, um, so an energy architect role to design and optimise those systems. And all of a sudden we're going to be crying out for skills from our colleges and training providers and are we going to gear up in time? How are we going to have that capacity on time to meet that mass adoption? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, that's com complex. It's, I just want to link what you're saying there to, to your comment there about modularization, because I think it's a really good example. So we, we see a, there's a lot of firms at Bride and Wood working with the government at the moment. I know Arabs are looking at it at the moment, but the idea that we can either make physical platforms or modules, you know, these kind of big Lego bricks that everything just works together. So we break down the problem and we make a, a solution that we know is pre-rationalized to work. But if we look at the effect of that on people, that's really interesting because it looks at the specialization of skills and the hyper-specialization of skills. So we are actually taking skill, the need for skill out of the market and dumping it into the module, to the platform. Now that as an approach 
isn't fully understood. We've seen it in mo we've seen it in building products for years, where we you know for the decision to take complexity off site or even away from the manufacturing process and dump it into either the CNC machine or the robot, by migrating that complexity out of human decision making, we reduce the market or the need for skills and people. Okay, so it's basically a risk mitigation thing. Okay, so if we can if we can handle the work that skills <coughs> have distributed in the world, if we can handle that work in a computer or a process or a machine or even in a standard, then we reduce the need for skill. And obviously this is orientated in profit. Okay. So I would say there is a conflict in our concept about what are the methods that we're going to deliver the promise of COP26, race to zero. There is a conflict between that as a mission and the kind of initiatives that we're taking. But I would like to link that through to what you're saying about the kind of skills. And I think what's really needed is, is a process fluency around, and I'm going to, and now I understand green skills. Mm. Okay, because I don't understand what green skills is a thing you do. Because I, I, I did an apprenticeship. Okay, so, so, I, <coughs> so I feel that's where skills are in a way for me. But if the fluency between the skills, you know, the, you know, the, the, the ground source heat pumps, the heat pumps, the PLCs, the controls, the actual difference between distributed data systems in buildings, distributed services in buildings, okay? But a process fluency, you know, that is vendor agnostic, you know, move between vendors, you know, but is unified at the standard. You know, the standards need to work. And I think, you know, uh, the BSI, the Health and Safety Executive, they've got to start working together with government and ac you know, academia, further education and, pe and, um, and the vendors, manufacturers, to kind of like not turn it into a political game or a money game about whose standard's going to win out, because that does happen. Okay? But actually, if you can unify process fluency around the standards and then actually start bringing that into um, either private uh, training courses or even uh, further education training courses. But I think process fluency is probably the key bit for me. Anyone want to take on that? I was just going to pick up on that sort of the, 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 the observation you made about modular. I think one, one of the issues is I think that actually it's looking at more uh, multi-skilled people, so it's not a matter of de-skilling. And yeah. actually if you look at how we sk use skills on building sites, it's not that clever. We could be clever, we could oh be yeah, clever absolutely. at that. The other thing is, that who does it open the market up to? Which is the really interesting thing. So Ilka are one of the first modular house builders based in North Yorkshire. They opened a factory. Within a year, without trying, they had a 35% female workforce. That is not your average on a construction site. Mm. Anywhere near. And they didn't do anything other than change the conditions of the employment. And I think that's quite interesting. That's also coming out in terms of the, you know, what we do for lorry drivers and that the conditions mm. of employment seem to be as, as important actually as the, as the money. Mm. It's, you, know, you don't treat us well as French drivers. And actually, if you gave us decent you know, places to park over and they weren't you know, dangerous, mm. then we, we might think about doing it. But for them, it was a regular place, a dry place, <coughs> a regular shift pattern. Uh, actually, what, one of the other significant things about um, a factory is they need a long-term employee. They're mm -hmm. not based on short-term contracts with no security. That's really changing the ground conditions, and that suddenly makes the workforce available to 50% of people who are pretty much being excluded. Um, not intentionally, but unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And that's quite exciting, actually. Um, and now I'm seeing great examples of people who are doing that and want to pursue a career in that area, which was just not there before. So. In one way, yes, it's a challenge around skills and our traditional view of skills, but it's also opening up some great opportunities and, and, <coughs> and some opportunities to be skilled in a different way. And your fluidity, I think, is a really good word, actually. That fluidity of skills, the ability to take your skills in one area and apply them somewhere else in a very segmented system that construction is, is, is really quite promising. Mm -hmm. Well, I just couldn't, uh, girls are great. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. need, need more girls. <laughs> no, no, I mean, Jake, I, th I also think now, um, Professor Scully, you found us. I hope you will t come out of London a little bit more because I, I, I no. think we've got some really <laughs> interesting businesses that, um, that, 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 that will benefit from your insight and, and learning as well and, and hopefully we can give you... I, I, I think there are a number of industries that need to change but I do think we have got 
one of the greatest opportunities to see change now um, coming out of COVID. When uh, people had a pause, people had an enforced pause, but they had an opportunity to sort of sit and think about their own lives and their own careers and their own family homes, and then businesses had a, an opportunity to think. So it's a kind of a window of opportunity that will close, but it, 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 it is a good one now. I'm a natural optimist, so you have to shoot me every now and then. So I was just going to pick up that, that, that's op opportunity to change. The Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre up in Sheffield work with the predominantly aerospace industry, but they also work with construction as well. And in the aerospace industry, said actually most of the supply chain is shared between the two big players, which is, which is Airbus and Boeing, um, and they offer the same sort of skills. And the opportunity to, to add um, additionality is about 1% to 2%. Construction, 50% conservatively, probably 75%. Mm. This is an industry which hasn't changed in 100 years. Mm. There's a massive opportunity to change it for the better. Uh, that's why they're interested in construction and think applying that manufacturing thinking to somewhere which really hasn't had it applied for a long time. And it takes you have to be brave. You have to say, well, some things we've been doing have been wrong, but actually that's fine. I think once you've got through that point of being mm -hmm. quite defensive, and it's a very defensive conservative industry, to say actually not everything in the, in the garden is rosy, then you can make some real changes with some major benefits. Thank you. Can I ask Siobhan to pick up on that point about capacity in that um, we've, we've talked about the labour crisis, we've talked about this emerging need for thousands and thousands of, of trained mm -hmm. installers. Construction faculties are currently full with traditional construction skills and they need to be. We've got 300,000 homes to build us, as Mark has told us. Um, no new money or ring-fenced money in the net zero strategy for mm -hmm. skills. Uh, hence bringing you back to your earlier point about we're heading for a green skills crisis. Mm. No, I, I, I don't think it's easy. And don't forget, we've got 1.2 million vacancies in the job workforce at the moment. So people are able to move from their current jobs and, um, uh, and anybody who is unemployed and can work, because some people uh, are unable to, they will find jobs. So there isn't going to be that natural desire to reskill uh, and go and learn and learn these skills. I, I will be fighting for more money on this. And, and as part of um, uh, the, the skills bill going through, I think that has to be a good challenge. I'm very welcome to you know, any of your points. So as this goes through Parliament, I'm happy to pick up and take into to Parliament. But it, it does need funding. We've got a new Secretary of State. Um, Nadim's only up the road, really. And uh, so we will be looking at it. But that's why I think, <coughs> as much as it may be a nebulous concept of green skills or something that we haven't quite settled on, to get the Department for Education thinking about their need to marry up with the Bayes Department, their needs to marry up um, with what the Treasury wants to achieve and what Number 10 wants to achieve, you have to have that constant link of um, uh, link through. And I think um, DFE can't do it all. Uh, they will need some understanding and cash through through the business teams. So. But I think employers need to speak out as well. Um, we've got to be much more open about what your needs are uh, as employers, um, what, where the vacancies are and where the frustrations are. I mean, I'm now having the LEP are very good at this, at bringing information to me uh, we've got the growth hub opening tomorrow at SGS um, so there will be m many more conversations uh, with businesses but I definitely think that needs feeding back mm -hmm. just a I few minutes left I was just gonna say I think it's where where does some of the government objectives you know risk most risk a failure of delivery mm -hmm. so the 300,000 houses probably at the moment the risk is in planning but that will get solved and it is getting solved and there are more being delivered the real risk is there will not be the workforce there to deliver it so, so actually, there'll be everybody will want to be doing it, and it won't happen because you haven't got people, and that's mm -hmm. and we can see that in other sectors. So, I think that connection of some of the other government departments' policy objectives, their biggest if they do their risk assessment, their biggest risk now is around labour, and, and yeah. actually that's why they should have an interest. And obviously, the natural thing is that you talk about visas and you know the ability to pull, but the whole world has pressed go at the moment. So, government only has a few levers um, to bring people in from international, and we can make our um, make our jobs. Uh, attractive and our, our our country is already attractive to work in but the whole country the whole world is trying to sort of achieve and go faster at the moment so it's not going to be easy but we do have that flexibility over immigration and skilled visas so that is <coughs> okay we're getting towards the close so if I ask each of you to s sum up and I suppose in summing up um, ad address the question is skills the issue that potentially could derail us from our path to net zero so I think it is. Um, 
but it's also it's a, it's a massive enabler. It's a massive opportunity. We've heard that some of the opportunities. There was somebody who posted something yesterday, and he's um, somebody I met a couple of weeks ago at UK Construction Week, and he shared the stand with me on a stage and spoke for the first time in front of pub uh, public. And he has come from a traditional construction background, and he's, he's a really good post. He said, "I thought my seeding was you know just being quite highly skilled." person in my particular sector, but I've now realised I can rise above that. And I think one of these things is around that opportunity of the people who don't go through that high academic route, who actually are incredibly skilled and have got some amazing skills that they can apply and mm -hmm. unlocking that. So I, th I think the, the answer is also in we need to be looking in not all the usual places. We need to be thinking about the people who don't go through the high academic routes, who may be much more manually skilled, who've got a lot to offer and how we enable them to do it. You know, the apprenticeships we talked about, people who are opting out of not going to university and doing something else. That is beginning to, I think, to emerge as a as a sort of um, as a more desired route, and it hasn't got. You know, it used to be go, well, what are you doing that for? People are now thinking, well, yeah, that sounds like quite a good thing to do, actually. The you know, idea of being in employment, being paid to do your study, having a job when you come out of it is all very good. So, so I think it's a risk, um, but I think the desire is there to sort of try and sort sort it. I think, as Peter said, it's not going to be straightforward. This will be a hard road, but I think it's a road we need to travel. Um, I, I think the skills reskilling and the the concept of thinking about our future slightly differently is having a heyday. Like it's properly having, uh, you know, it's got its own PR company and everybody is thinking slightly differently um, uh, uh, about what education means and I think that is really positive. I, I think there is going to be a real recruitment uh, struggle for the next few months and, and potentially years um, but I don't think it's insurmountable and I think with a real focus on education from young to old and then an, a complete understanding that if you are feeling stuck in a rut or don't like your job or just you know thinking your skills could do as well we go and reskill we go to our colleges we do the night the night courses um, uh, uh, and the, the the desire from our youngsters to want to fix the future and help is going into parents as well so uh, that and so I think that kind of environmental focus and um, uh, and the desire to make better buildings the desire to make better transport and more sustainable options um, will be with us all uh, as we go forward <coughs> I, I agree with Siobhan entirely about what young people want right now and that desire to get out there and make a difference is enormous and I think from my perspective anything to add to what's been said is <coughs> the students that I work with are increasingly discriminating about where they're about to go and who they are prepared to work with and employers come in and they get grilled and they get questioned and they get put on the spot so if employers want the young people with the skills it's going to be the kind of employers these young people want to work with. Um. <laughs> Just, just quick, I mean, there's two things that I, I want to say. And the fir first thing is really, I feel like we, we're at a kind of precipice now. Okay, it's just mm. we've had enough, we've really got to make some change. I feel that we've been at this precipice for 20 years, mm. okay, for as long as I've been thinking and working in and around this space. 20 years ago, we were saying, right, we've got to automate the construction industry, it will be robots, it will be CAD, it will be skills, productivity, and so on. And I would, and I, I think a really genuine underlying question is what's holding us back? Mm -hmm. And that is not a trivial answer there. It's like, why aren't we changing? Because we have been here for 20 years. Anyone wants to go back and look at the conferences in and around architecture and the construction industry, you know, at the turn, turn of the century, that's what we were talking about. It was computation, grasshopper, parametric design that's what it was doing then but you know we're not changing and I don't and I to be honest there is an article by Mark Carney where he is talking about the relationship of the green delivering the green promise at the moment and the relationship to the late 50s uh, civil rights movement in America and he said that was a turning point and it was a <coughs> long hard push all the way since and I think that's where we are now but I don't see this kind of turnkey point that we are at the moment. So I think there's two things. What, what is it that's holding us back? Okay, and what are those baby steps forward that we are gonna have to take? Thank you. Can we thank the panel for their informed, insightful view? Thank you very many thanks for uh, being with us. <laughs>